It's been a few months, but I finally got all of the parts I need to test my custom carrier board for the Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4. Let's solder it up and see if it works. To solder this board, I had a stencil made, which is going to make this process much easier. To start, I made a jig that's the exact size of the board that I'm planning to assemble that just slides right in there like this. Note that I had these boards assembled before DK Red was even an option, which is why these are purple, but I recommend giving DK Red a shot. I created this jig by taping some PCBs around my target PCB, and they need to be the exact same height. I then taped my stencil down and lined it up with all of the holes, at least good enough so that I can hold it down and scrape paste across it. I then just put a bead of solder paste down and use a credit card or whatever provided scraper or spreader you have, this could also be something like an old windshield wiper, and spread that around the openings in the stencil. When you're done, scrape off the excess and then carefully lift up the stencil so that you don't move much of the paste around on the pads. Go through your bill of materials and carefully place each of the parts on their associated footprint. I like to mark the bags with the ref des so that I know exactly which part goes where. Because of the chip shortage that's going on right now, I was not able to find a drop-in replacement for one of the parts, and that is the ESD protection chip that's supposed to carefully monitor or prevent ESD on the USB data lines. So I'm just going to go without it and hope that nothing goes wrong when I'm using this board. I probably would not want to deploy this board without ESD protection on those USB lines, but for now, I hope, I think, it will be good enough. With all the parts placed, I'm going to carefully remove the board. Make sure that my USB port is actually down because it couldn't go all the way down with another PCB there as part of the jig. And then I'm going to take the PCB and it's time to go to the oven. This is my sort of homemade reflow oven. I used a Controlio 3 kit in order to hack a toaster oven so that I can do soldering just like this. I'm going to put the board in the oven and then select my reflow profile for lead free soldering and let it go. When it's done, we can open the door and very carefully pull the board out. Remember that it's probably still hot. So I recommend using something like tweezers or needle nose pliers to get your board. When everything is cooled off, I recommend inspecting all of your solder joints using something like a microscope or a 10x loop. This will allow you to get very close to see what's going on with your solder, making sure that there's no bridging, no caught solder balls underneath some of the parts, and to make sure everything is appropriately connected. The other thing you can do is come in with a multimeter and especially ground and power to make sure that you don't have any shorts. If you find any shorts, what I recommend doing is coming in with some flux, fluxing your part or a side of your part like our Hirose connectors here, grabbing a soldering iron and then either dragging it across your pins to break any of the shorts or just going after the pins that have the short and then just touching them briefly to break the bridge. Once you're satisfied that there are no shorts, I recommend giving the board a brief smoke test. This includes plugging in the USB-C connector, powering it on, probably removing your hand as best as possible, so that when you power it on, in case anything blows up, you're not hurting yourself. Once you're sure that nothing blows up, remove power, and we are going to add our Compute Module 4. You'll want to make sure that it lines up appropriately. Notice that there's a larger space below the Hirose connector than on top of it, so you want to make sure that lines up with the mating Hirose connector on the CM4. So go ahead and add the CM4. And you are welcome to use screws, nuts, spacers, and standoffs on your mounting holes if you'd like to make sure that the board is more mechanically secure. In order to upload a Raspberry Pi image to the CM4, we're going to need to send it an image that's been pre-made from our host computer. I did not add an SD card to the base carrier, which means we can't just 
upload an image to an SD card and then plug it in like we would do on a regular Pi. Instead, this base carrier requires you to use an eMMC chip, which is an option on the CM4. To upload an image, you're going to need to put the CM4 into bootloader or the Raspberry Pi boot mode. To do this, you need to connect the NRPi boot pin to ground before you apply power to it. This will cause the Raspberry Pi to boot up. In a special way, this image will be saved on the eMMC chip. Since I forgot to print the pin names in silkscreen, I had to look at the schematic, see that the last pin is my NRPi boot pin, and then my second pin is ground. So I need to make sure that those are connected. With that, I will connect the USB micro B port to a cable that goes to my computer. This is for data only. It cannot provide power to the CM4. Power must come from the USB-C connector, which I will plug in. I will then turn it on, and if everything works, the CM4 should be providing 3.3 volts to the red LED, which should turn on, letting me know that at least it's getting power. From here, we need to download a couple of tools on our host computer in order to get it to connect to the Raspberry Pi bootloader mode and then send it a Linux operating system image. The two tools that we need to download are the RPi boot and the Raspberry Pi imager tools. To start, head to raspberrypi.org documentation hardware compute module slash cm dash emmc slash flashing dot md. This is a full tutorial on how you flash the eMMC on the compute module. Feel free to read through this, but I'm going to show you the steps here, at least for Windows. Note that you can get it to work on Linux and Mac OS, so feel free to read those instructions. Click this link to download the installer for rpiboot.exe. You should also head to raspberrypi.org slash software. Scroll down and you should find a link for the Raspberry Pi Imager. Download this for your operating system and run the installer, accepting all the defaults. When you've finished installing those tools, you'll want to look for RPi Boot, run that, and that's just going to bring up a simple tool that will look for the Compute Module 4 and then enable it in mass storage device mode. If you're on Windows, you'll probably get a few pop-ups asking you to format it. Just click Cancel. Don't worry that it's not accessible. It should look like a mass storage device, like a USB thumb drive, but it doesn't have any formatting in it. Don't worry, we're about to send it a raw image. Now you'll want to run the Raspberry Pi imager, and we're going to choose our operating system. We do not want something with a desktop, since we did not have any sort of display out with our particular base carrier board. For this, I recommend going right to Raspberry Pi OS Lite, as this has no desktop environment. Click on that one, click your storage, which for me is the Raspberry Pi mass storage device. That should be the location of your eMMC. This happened to mount to the G drive on Windows for me, so click that and click right. Click yes when prompted that it will erase all the data on the drive, and there should be nothing on that drive. Wait for a moment while that completes its writing process. Note that it will download Raspberry Pi OS Lite in order to do this. Once it's done, you should get the pop-up window showing you that writing was successful. Click continue and you can exit out of this program. For this next part, you're going to want something like PuTTY, or if you're not on Windows, whatever serial program you have access to. My favorite way to connect to embedded Linux is through a very simple serial terminal. And to do this, we're going to need a serial to USB board that connects to our base carrier. The Raspberry Pi operating system does not have UART enabled by default, so we have to enable it. To do that, make sure your Raspberry Pi is in bootloader mode. It should not have changed from before, but you might have to cycle power, but make sure that the NRPi boot pin is still connected to ground. If you did cycle power, you're going to have to run RPi boot again, and let it discover your CM4 that's now in bootloader mode. If you're using Windows, you'll probably get a bunch of pop-ups. However, what you want is the boot drive. Go into that, find config.txt, open it and scroll down. 
At the bottom, you'll want to add the line enable UART equals one, make sure there are no spaces, and then save this file. This will enable all of the UART ports. We don't have to do any sort of special mapping to pins, since pins 14 and 15 should be mapped to TX and RX and give us a serial terminal out for Linux. Remove power from your board and go ahead and disconnect your USB-B cable since we don't need that anymore. There are ways to run SSH on Linux and have it do something like pipe a console wrapped up in SSH over your USB connector, assuming the Raspberry Pi is in USB client mode. There's a lot of work required to make that happen, so my preferred option is to use a simple USB to serial connector like this and just go through the TTY port. To use this, we will connect the pin right after the ground pin to RX on the converter board. I will also need to connect ground, which is the second pin, to ground on the board. And then I will connect RX on my Raspberry Pi to TX on the FTDI board. Then I'm going to connect my FTDI board, like so. And then I'm going to give power to my CM4 and see what happens. With the Raspberry Pi now booting up in regular mode, not bootloader mode, we should be able to get some sort of output on the serial terminal. If you're on Windows, you'll want to figure out what COM port is being used by your USB to serial board. In this case, it's COM6 for me. Open up PuTTY, go to Serial, do COM6. You'll want 115.200 for the baud rate. Click Open. And with any luck, you'll either see post messages or a login window. If not, you might want to hit Enter a couple of times just to make that prompt appear. And from there, we should be able to log in. The default login username is Pi. The default password is Raspberry, just like any other Raspberry Pi that we might have used in the last, I don't know, 10 years. And with this, everything is working, but I want to run one quick test. I am going to make a very simple blinky happen. To do this, let's turn off the Raspberry Pi. I will need this ground pin, which I will connect to the output of my LED here. And that's going to be shared with the FTDI board. And then GPIO 7 is the second to last pin here and I'm gonna make that drive the LED. Let's see if we can make this blink. Lucky for us, this version of the Raspberry Pi operating system comes with Python pre-installed, along with the RPI GPIO library that we can use to do some basic input-output on the pins. To use it, I'll create a very simple Python script, which I'll call Blinky, and import the rpi.gpio library as gpio and import the time library. Next, I'll set the library to use BCM mode, which means I refer to the pins by their gpio number rather than their physical pin number. In this case, that second to last pin on the board is gpio7, so we'll set that up as an output. Then we'll create a simple while forever loop. I will use the gpio.output function to turn pin seven high, or on in this case, sleep for one second, turn it off, and sleep for another second, and that will just continue forever. I will save this. I'm using Nano here, but feel free to use whatever editor comes pre-installed on your Raspberry Pi operating system, maybe something like Vim. And then I'll call python blinky.py. With any luck, the LED will be flashing, and we can verify that we have a fully functioning embedded system running Linux. There's a lot you can do with embedded Linux, and the Raspberry Pi Compute module makes it pretty easy to create your own custom carrier board. Good luck and happy hacking.